So I'm delighted to have as a returning guest, Cashin White, who's the Director of Growth and Innovation at BOK Financial based in Denver. And you can see behind him that it's a beautifully sunny day in Denver, which is great. Uh, Cashin, welcome. I'm glad you're joining us again to talk a little bit about what you've done recently to augment the sales enablement efforts of your organization by building a sales training program that you rolled out. It, you began rolling it out last, early this year or last year? Yeah, it began in the spring of this year at 23. Okay, so it's pretty fresh. So give us a little bit of context about uh, BOK Financial and why you saw a need to do this. Yeah, so BOK Financial is a financial institution just shy of $50 billion in assets. You know, we've got a strong middle market presence, a strong commercial banking, uh, small business uh, team, specialized verticals in healthcare, CRE, and energy, and, and this huge wealth management group. And, you know, a lot of the different groups have their own sales enablement culture, but we, we really wanted to focus in on our middle market and commercial banking segments. So commercial banking, let's call that banking businesses, $5 million to $50 million in revenue, and then middle market's going to be $50 million and up. In that space, our bankers are more generalists. Everything else is, is highly niche within our company, and that makes it easier for those folks to network and, and grow their clients. But in, in the generalist space, which has its pros and cons, the pros are a huge swath of customers and prospects that you can go after. Uh, the cons are that it's hard to get very specialized and you have to cast a wider net. And we were looking at creating a more intentional sales culture in those two verticals. And at the same time, we had the confluence of four brand new technologies that we were trying to assimilate into our sales culture. So it was time for a formal go-to-market strategy. And that's when they tapped me on the shoulder to roll it out. So, so you probably looked outside for, for people that could support you, but you opted to do it inside. Uh, can you explain a little bit about why? Yeah, I, I would say there were two things driving it. Uh, the first was obviously uh, the, the the powers that be that tapped me on the shoulder, gave me zero budget. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good starting point. Yeah, so so I was like, okay, you know, and sometimes it's fun to work in a in a you know with scarcity. It forces you to be very creative. Um, but also, this is the beginning of a very long focused process, and I thought it would be important for me to do it solo, to figure out where everyone's at. And I also thought it was important to speak to them in the vernacular of a banker. You know, I'm going on my 23rd year in commercial middle market banking, and it's a very specific set of skills and specific set of products that we deliver to our clients. I didn't want it to be just vague generalities about sales. I really wanted to focus it in on a day in the life of a relationship manager. So you, so you know, each each state has its own culture. Each line of business has its own culture. So it, not only was it a learning process for the bankers, but also for me, which would help me create a more customized follow-up training throughout the years. Mm -hmm. So. So you alluded to the fact that at the same time you were doing this, you were introducing some new technologies. How important were those technologies in your thought process? They were huge. Um, I mean, we went from zero to 100 as far as sales enablement tools go in late 22 to early 23. Um, and when, when, you, when you log into these tools, each has its own user interface. And each is asking the user to adopt new soft skills in order to navigate the tool, understand the tool, maximize its usefulness, extract the data, utilize the data, and create a new plan. The exciting part, though, is that these tools were finally giving bankers something that we've really lacked in our careers, mm -hmm. which is exactly who we need to be prospecting and, and it limits the guesswork on, are they bankable? Are they going to fit our culture? With the data we have now, you can be pretty high level of confidence that who you're calling on would be a good fit for our bank. 
you don't have to have those awkward conversations of, oh, I finally got a package. Thank you for sending it in. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not going to be able to help you. So it, it obviously was great timing and that you could you could reinforce the value of these tools. Because one of the challenges that a lot of my clients have faced historically who have provided great tools uh, is that sometimes it's hard to get people to adopt them. But you were able to build that into the uh, the program that you ran and reinforce that going forward. Yeah, the, the training showed them real entry-level baby steps on how to use it. Now, we did couple each tool with very transparent usage reports for, for senior leadership to see how their teams are using it. And those are used to have more effective one-on-one. -on -one. And then we also created so, sort of, we almost gamified it, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, so now you've learned everything about these tools. Well, let, let's create a top 20 prospect list using all four tools. Mm -hmm. Build it out in Salesforce create the recurring tasks. And, and so we coached them for about three months for all bankers uh, to create their perfect top 20 based on whatever they're comfortable prospecting towards. And that required them to be logging into these tools, downloading the data, getting used to using it, asking questions. Uh, <clears throat> and then we created another gamification where we asked them to, to define all of the COIs that surround those top 20. So again, they're going into the tools and getting used to setting up the alerts and and now the empowering the sales managers to start having good one on ones with their bankers asking them, okay, how's it going calling on this list? You know, Salesforce has great dashboards and reporting so we can see the effectiveness and how many calls are being made, how many are resulting in opportunities, how much is resulting in closed business. So the transparency is very high. Mm -hmm. around these tools. There's really nowhere to hide. It's obvious if you're using them or not. Um, so that those were our two key things, with constant reinforcement through gate gam gamification and then the transport, transparent reporting for uh, sales leaders. Yeah, and you, you hit at something which you know is one of my priorities in helping my clients, which is trying to ensure that your frontline sales managers are actively involved and almost as soon as possible, even if not in the session themselves, playing a role in, in coaching their team members. So I guess I'm curious, as you look at what you've done, uh, and it's it's true of a lot of things, you know, you're, it's a process, it takes time, you're not talking about sprinting, but what have you learned so far as a result of uh, the initiative that you undertook this year? Yeah, I learned that it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. It's going to take a little bit more time than I thought. Um, you know, I think there's all different types of personalities. Some are more inclined to adopt technology early. Some are more inclined to stiff arm it for as long as they possibly can. Uh, so getting getting the training to speak to everybody was the, probably the most difficult thing. But and, and then, you know, each, like Kansas City is going to have a different culture than our Scottsdale office and different than Houston and different than Oklahoma City. And middle market is going to have a different culture than commercial banking and small business banking. But in there, you can find commonalities. Um, and, it, and I think it's also important to identify early on who are going to be your super users. And that's pretty quick to identify based on their engagement during the sales training, their follow-up questions. And then, of course, using, looking at the usage report. And since I can't be everywhere at once, I mean, we have 25 distinct offices across six states where there may be a group of relationship managers designating in each group sort of a, a super user, subject matter expert, someone that, that they can lean on. And then augmenting my training through other lines of business like HR, marketing, and make sure that everyone's coming at it and reinforcing it. Um, but I think that was the biggest thing I learned was just you're going to have to be really, really flexible uh, because what one team may need is going to be very different than another. Yeah, Can't I think that's very one. smart. Yeah, that's I think that's a good takeaway. Is there anything, Cashin, that you would do differently if you had to do it all over again? I think I would do differently. It's a good question. Um, I think I would have maybe done a few more pilot runs 
to really dial it in. I had to give this presentation, I think, eight times. The first two um, was a bit of an experiment, and I don't know if they got the full thing, but by the last two, I had it completely dialed in, and I knew exactly where the engagement was going to be the highest. It's a three-hour presentation nonstop. I mean, we feed them, but it's a working lunch, right? Um, and by the end, I had it dialed in. So maybe a few more dry runs up front because holding people's attention for three hours is going to be tough. And I go over a lot. And, and, you know, one thing that was dropped on us in the middle of this presentation was generative AI. And, and, and that, I mean, that was so mind-blowing when you show somebody ChatGPT for the first time which during my training I did, I'd say for more than half of the bankers, that was their first time seeing AI. Mm -hmm. And making sure that didn't dominate the training. Because that's all of a sudden that's all they want to talk about was, oh, how do we use this? How do we, you know, this, this. So, uh, yeah, something that big and that wide, I probably should have done a little bit more. Uh, but that, that, that was the downside of not having a lot of resources. I didn't have a lot of time to bounce it off folks. I just had to sort of go out there and see how it went. <laughs> Well, it sounds like a, a great initiative. So let me ask you a question about what you see. Now, this is in your role as a director of growth and innovation at BOK Financial. How do you see ChatGPT impacting, say, commercial and middle market banking going forward? Yeah, I say early on, and so I'm on an internal uh, sort of AI committee that we created with lots of different folks from different lines of business giving their input. And you know, one thing that we're going to look to do is, is in-source that technology so it lives on our server so the bankers can feel comfortable using that technology. Um, we don't want them using the public version and inadvertently, you know, putting data in there that they shouldn't. Uh, but once, we, once we're able to do that, I think we're going to see some low-hanging fruit. We'll be able to search our own knowledge centers. So, for example, if I want to get a rundown on all the products that we offer to high net worth individuals because some of my clients may have a liquidity event coming, right now it's sort of a hodgepodge of information I have to grab from different sources. Well, I could use this in-house ChatGPT. Hey, give me a rundown of all the high products a high net worth individual could access at BOK Financial. <clears throat> so, rolls it down and, and say, okay, and I'm going to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area who are the people I should contact that can deliver these products? Boom. Stuff like that will be really good. And then eventually, I think we can move it into some fraud prevention uh, technology. I think we're going to be beholden to our vendors coming along for the ride as well, providing this technology. Microsoft's going to be a big one. Um, and, then, and then maybe enhanced credit, helping us get past the laborious spreading stage faster, get it right into our charts so we can move straight to the judgmental part. This will help on the front end with bird dogging packages before we even kick it into underwriting, and then it'll also help our underwriting team just speed up that uh, that whole you know speed to decision timeline. Well, it sounds to me, Cashin, like whatever round two of your sales uh, coaching sessions uh, entails, it'll probably bring Chat GPT and other AI tools into the forefront. But thank you again for uh, spending time here on this Ned Talks. Uh, I appreciate your sharing with us what you've learned and uh, am interested in how it goes. Thanks, Ed.